So she used the uh, you know the ones of the sentient beings um, to invite everyone into the Buddhist path. Uh, Infinite Life Sutra is um, you know, manifestations of Buddha Amitabha's practice. Everyone should um, learn from it. When we are uh, inviting friends and family, we need to use a lot of convenience, you know, whatever they can get, whatever they can accept. Because as the proverb says, if you want to teach people to be kind, do not use something that is too hard for them to um, achieve. And don't set the standard too high, you know. When it just started, don't tell them, be Buddha, you know, let go of all your five desires. Because they might not understand why yet. So start from something they can do, you know, in their daily life. Start from something easy, reachable, doable. That's how we um, can help and lead uh, the, the beings. Uh, and then we can see uh, Venerable Master Ching Kong when he talks about the... Um, uh, in, in, his, in his talks, he talks about three kinds of giving, right? Uh, I think everyone would have the idea. The first giving is the giving of wealth. And of course, giving of wealth yields wealth. The giving of um, dharma yields intelligence, wisdom, and intelligence. The giving of fearlessness uh, yields longevity, uh, fearlessness, right? If you give people fearless, you get longevity. So these are the three common types of giving we can do. Most people uh, wish to have wealth, once wealth. Um, and also not just wealthy, also be smart and wise and a very long life to enjoy it. So these are the three um, traits everyone loves to have. That's why we must always encourage everyone to do these three types of givings in your, in your own life. And uh, it's doable. So Venerable himself, 20 years ago, he has encountered a uh, situation. When he was uh, in Shenzhen, there is a corporation. Um, promotes an ad, you know, 20, 200k per year at salary. It's a, in, yu, in yuan, Chinese yuan. Um, it's quite um, lucrative back then, 20 years ago. Um, and one of the requirements to get this lucrative job is to understand, able to memorize Di Zigui. Not understand, sorry, memorize Di Zigui. So when he posted this um, advertisement, the um, locale in Shenzhen, people in Shenzhen, they all came and asked, uh, asked the, the publishers, you know, the book publishers, do you have Di Zigui at your area? Because we have not heard of Di Zigui before. Um, because um, of this advertisement, a lot of people trying to get the job, you know, trying to fulfill requirement, find this way. Uh, so use this logic. Uh, if your parents, uh, you know, if you look at this actual case that happened, uh, even the corporation you know, prioritize on people understanding the values, traditional values, you know. In, from traditional cultures. Um, so if I'm the parent, uh, should think about this part aspect when educating our children or setting up for our children. So this is how um, a wise person, you know, lead people into goodness. Uh, you start with what they really want, you know, a stable job, a good job, a co career, stuff like that. Um, and then they gradually go into this teaching. So, um, Master Jingkong also mentioned, uh, you know, if we use the traditional culture in corporate uh, settings, it's also um, help to promote uh, the teaching. 
For example, if there's any company listed in the top 500, you know, SFX 500 stocks, um, you use the traditional value to manage, uh, as they are, you know, corporate cultures. Um, I have to say they, that you know, confidence that it gives to the world, of, you know, believing goodness of the world, it's um, strengthened. Do you guys have any friends that do um, work in corporates? Uh, if um, you know they have the opportunities to get in contact with the teachings, uh, it might you know become a role model for other corporates, and it will help to pave a way for the um, revitalization, revitalization, uh, revitalization of the traditional cultures and. Faith in humanity restored, basically. Yeah. If there is vow, there is strength. Remember, this is not vow. This is not trying to, um, how to say, trying to sort something. This is something like a condition that happens you when know, you're right at the right place at the right time and you use whatever you learn from the teachings in your daily life, not deliberately trying to do it. Like Master Chingo himself, and he did not deliberately find all these venues, you know, that he did. Everyone trying to find him, uh, and not just one time, like, when he become a, before he became a monk, he he was just a normal label Buddhist, but he's been practicing well. People oh, trying to find him nine times before um, he agreed to become a monk. And only after his teacher, Mr. Li Bingnan, uh, Bingnan Li has um, agreed for him to be uh, a monk. And he made a promise to be follow the path of Shayamuni Buddha. That means he focused on giving the Dharma talks. So, can I ask, has any um, corporations uh, in this world uh, encounter difficulties? Right? They do. They have obstacles, right? They have problems to solve. They have their own family to worry about. But when they see you, fellow you know, people work in their same environments, still able to maintain a peace of mind, you know, good relationships with your family, then they will be curious. Like, how do you do that amidst all this chaos? For example, your um, relationship with your spouse is very harmonious. Uh, but for them, Maybe they um, argue almost every single day over small matters, over big matters. And it is quite painful. Right? So they try to learn, how do you do that? So I want to bring out a very real example from the corporate world. Um, Inamori Kazuo from Japan. He has a very successful model um, of running a corporate. And he's influenced is almost is equal to those people who are very good at speaking, like the spe speakers. And the best part about him is he follows the traditional cultures, you know, traditional values, and Buddhism. And why did he do so well in this world? Uh, in Buddhism, we always talk about karma. If the karma, if the cause is not right, the effect will not be right. So the cause has to be right. right. What is the cause? Our heart, our sincerity. What do we want? If, if one has a very sincere, strong vow to seek the path, seek enlightenment, they will get it. They will get it. As another proverb goes, um, we do not feel difficulties in the world. What we feel is we do not have the will to see, to see it through. In our Sutra, in Final Sutra, the Buddha Amitabha mentioned 
Even though my whole body and mind is in deep sufferings, my vow will never relinquish from this. So back to Mr. Inamori Kazuo. Um, he always asks himself, every time he do things, because his company is in top 500, and he's a, he ran Kyoto Ceramics. Um, he created Kyoto Ceramics. And not just one company, another company. He also saw another electronic um, business. Um, this electronic business has been running since the Meiji era, so 1800s. And uh, the cost and sales uh, of this um, running these electronic companies is very expensive. Uh, so there is an opportunity. For trade, you think about if I can also open another telecommunications company that reduce the cost for people to use the services, right? Then it will benefit all the sentient, uh, all the people in Japan. So all he think about is, you know, he came from a place of. How can I benefit the people that when he trying to do that, everyone disagrees with him. Uh, disagree with Mr. Kazuo, say you cannot. This is this is not gonna work. And what he told his friends and family, I do not do it for myself. This is needed by the people. Uh, and there he goes. He made it. And the net revenue is about 100 billion Japanese yen. And not just profitable, he able to cut down the service price to affordable level where everyone can use it. And then later on, after you know this successful companies, he has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, so. He's, um, but instead of being, you know, feeling hopeless, he's very calm. And he kind of expected it in a sense. He's like, it proves that he has an impermanence, a very strong impermanence understanding. He understands things change. And the first thing in his mind is to prepare his successors, is to groom his successors for these two companies. Everyone um, should have an impermanence with because it will prepare them for future. Mm. Like no matter what you, what you run, running a family, a company. And then he's like, I need to think about not just you know when I'm here, also when I'm not here. Who can take over this company? So after he arranged his successors, two successors, he went. You know, down out of the scene and become a monk in Japan. When he was, you know, recovering, recuperating, you know, in his retreat, Japan airline has bankrupted. That was early 2000s. Uh, Japan airline has bankrupted. And the prime minister of that time, you know, went to the mountain, it's like all day, went to the mountain and seek his help to save the national corporation. Japan Airline, like Qantas. Um, so he went out of his retreat. You know, like, went out of his Buddhist retreat and go back into the scene uh, at the invest in invitation of the Prime Minister. He only has one um, thing in mind. Uh, if the country needs me, I will serve. So he used that service mindset you know, to the country to do this job. Because if this company falls, 3,000 employees will lose their jobs. And if Japan Airline failed to continue, you know, liquidated, then the other companies will become monopolizing. We will monopolize our economy, uh, the Japan economy, flight market. Hence, because monopoly, the price will go up. So he think about this is quite important to maintain an uh, affordable price for the people. So what he did is he become he ran out from his um, monk retreat, returned to lay status, lay person, and then he went into 
in Japan Airline. Over here, we need to understand he do not attach. I'm a monk, you know, I cannot do this. So this is called Prashna Paramita or Paramita. Wisdom. People with um, Prashna, which is Bora. Prashna, the wisdom, able to um, not attach to whatever form they take. They will do whatever it needs to be done. So he let go of his monk status, become a lay person, to do his job. So what's more important, no matter what you do, is your intention. Why are you doing this? For what? So when he go out of his mountain and do this job, after two years he turned around negative, I don't know, negative millions or billions of yen into positive revenue of yen. Exactly the opposite. So he revived the national corporation. So anyone in any place can have such influence. So traditional value and you know Buddhism teaching has this power, has this has this strength if we use it correctly, if we learn it correctly. So this is the real example of using what they want, using what they want as a starting point to lead them into the path of righteousness, of enlightenment. So, back to the Sutra, uh, we talk about another Sutra, the uh, Lotus Sutra has an analogy of house on fire and the Buddha has using the uh, the kids are trapped in there not going out because they have having fire so Buddha is trying to Buddha is like the owner of the house and trying to save these kids so he used ox cart, goat cart, horse cart when they were lured out of their burning house it's actually white ox cart which is the best of everything they could expect so that's what Buddha is trying to do so using this understanding, um, every t teacher, good teacher, uh, Buddha will want his students to be better than him, to have better achievement than him. That's what a good teacher does, that's what a true master does. Master Shantao, Pure Lens Patriarch, mentioned it before, why do Buddha appear in this world? All because they're trying to point out Amitabha Buddha's vow, seas of vow. You know, the seas of vow of Amitabha Buddha is vast, just like the ocean, and composing everyone. Everyone, anyone who have understood these teachings, they will be able to attain. Enlightenment. If everyone really gets what Amitabha Buddha is trying to do, gets why the vow, why he do this, there's no need for Buddha and Bodhisattva to show so many other methods. Because everything is trying to lead you back to this white, white ox cut, the best of the best. Benefit for all beings. Why? Why is this so good? Why is Amitabha Buddha's vow so good? Because it's the most effective, low entry, low barrier, low barrier and effective entry point to the highest achievement, which is Buddhahood. Shaimuni Buddha also um, teach, you know, one of the students instruct one of the students to prepare the requirements in order to go to pure life. There's three pure, uh, three deeds, three categories of deeds required, three categories of fortunes required to accumulate in order to go to pure life. Fortune and merits. First one is the human and heaven um, level of uh, merits. Failure to your parents, love and respect to your parents, to your teachers, listen to the teaching, practice it, um, do not kill, practice no killing, no hatred, 
and then follow the ten virtuous uh, deeds. And then the second one is the um, we call it the um, small vehicle vow, Hinayana, small small vehicle vow, which is arahant. How to be arahant? You know, precepts. Um, follow the precepts of Buddha. And then the last one is the Mahayana, the big vehicle, um, merits and fortunes. So those are the foundational practice to get to that level. The last one is to be Bodhisattva. That means understand the Mahayana vows. You know, why do we have vows to save all sentient beings? Right. So those are stage by stage. So if a teacher wants a student to achieve great achievements. Um, there is a lot of um, foundation we can do. Buddhist, Buddha already mentioned, if one um, only learn directly from Mahayana teachings without understanding the foundations, which is Hinayana, the small vehicle, and the human and heaven um, foundational deeds, and then they suddenly want to be Buddhist, Bodhisattva, it's not possible and they are not Buddhist. So we always need to follow step by step. So it includes us who practice Pure Land. Right. Even though it's quick, we also need to have foundations. So what did Master say? Every time, everything we encounter, the attitude we should have is to be moderate, be forgiving, and how we treat people and ourselves should be we treat other people with generosity you know, not just material also in terms of interactions but treat ourselves as strict as you can be ask yourself to be that role model be strict on yourself be easy on others so that's what we mean by being moderate being generous being forgiving and this is a trait of a true heart you know of, of a person who reveals his true nature uh, Buddha nature so if we think about our daily life how many incorrect thoughts have we give rise to erroneous thoughts for example our the words we give out is incorrect inappropriate you say something that is too much or hurtful, stuff like that. So, have we reviewed, have we always, you know, check on our conduct, our speech? Back in Ming Dynasty, there was a person, um, he's always been correcting his own thoughts and speech. One day he slept, he dreamt, he was in an orchard, picking up a few fruits from other people's household. So he woke up and said, I should not take what is not mine. This is neighbor's orchard. So he's just dreaming, right? He's not thinking about it, but he's dreaming about it. So he's um, correcting his behavior by, you know, not eating for a few days. I asked myself, I could not do this. I should not even think about this. So he, you know, kind of starved himself for a few days as a reminder. So this is the level of awareness he has on his conduct. Um, on the other hand, you know, we can see most of, the, uh, most of the time we get triggered by other people and trying to get back at them, trying to um, fight and all that. So our direction is reversed against our Buddha nature. Uh, it does not correspond with our Buddha nature. So we're trying to pinpoint other people, trying to um, ask other people, demand other people, but very loose on ourselves. If a person truly follows the Buddha nature, if they ask themselves strictly and be kind towards others, when you see people like that, you know, encounter people like that, you will naturally feel very um, 
which is kind of embarrassed. Uh, I, I did not do so well, but he's not you know, chasing me down like that. Uh, he's, um, he's aware of it, but he's not like getting too hard on my conduct. So I feel, you know, I need to correct myself to you know, repay this generosity of them. This is what we mean by generosity. Being forgiving more generous, generous towards others. Only then you can truly touch them to, to you know, to move their hearts to actually change their own conduct. So sincerity is the key ingredient in this. Uh, if we couldn't do that, that means we are not sincere enough. Another example. A uh, very um, famous uh, story in ancient China, you know, the ancient kings of Shun. Uh, Sorry, it's just like... So, descendants of Shu. Uh, there's a descendants of Shu. <laughs> He's just trying to say um, some of us uh, might be the descendants of uh, Shu. Uh, have the uh, heritage of Shu. Because, you know, this is pre unification in China and everyone more or less related to them. Um, so the point is, this um, King Shun has a very famous uh, deeds of being respectful towards their parents. Um, so when Shun, he was king, he passed by the local place. Wherever he goes, everyone follows him. So he stayed at one place. One day, everyone, uh, first year, everyone accumulate. Second thing, it becomes. Second year, it becomes a town. Third year, it becomes a city. So Shun was in a place called later in ancient China, and everyone, or later is like a pond. Everyone's trying to fight for a best spot to fish but he did not criticize the behaviors of those people. He always been generous towards others. So what he did is he, instead of fighting like everyone else for a good spot for fishing, he gave away the best spot to the elderly so that they can fish, because they can move better as the young people does. So he did that all the time, consistently. One year later, it touches everyone. Everyone slowly emulates his behavior you know, be courteous and let each other have the spots. So this is a good culture that he has formulated by his example. This is the example of how a person who truly is um, generous, forgiving and moderate, able to do towards others, towards an organization. So if we look back, relate to ourselves, you know, how does it relate to me, like the way I conduct, uh, the way I influence people, am I really, you know, sincere enough when I'm dealing with people, with things? Have I truly generous, forgiving, and reflective of myself? Just like um, Sutra, in fact, like Sutra mentioned, uh, protect our mouth, do not commit. Um, gossips protect our heart. Uh, do not give rise to any evil thoughts. Right? Protect our body. Do not do any things that is against the uh, misconduct. Because I commonly hear from parents complaining about their children. My my kids do not listen to me. They do not do their homework. So this father is complaining like that. And complaining is uh, coming out of uh, coming out of afflictions, coming out of, you know, great hatred, ignorance. And 
person who cultivates must change this scene. Right? He has to use rationality, he has to use wisdom. And we, if we listen back to the teachings of the ancient ancestors, they always mention one thing. If anything we do does not go our way, the only place we need to look at is ourselves. So if we look at these actual examples, this father, why his son is not listening to him, not doing his homework, because his father always make jokes and in a way that you know the kids don't take him seriously. So he didn't he didn't his word is not worth a go, basically. He's not a man of his word, so to speak. So it makes his kid having an impression on this is not serious. So whatever he says cannot be taken seriously. So I myself also has the problem like that. I always make you know meaningless jokes. Uh, sometimes uh, if I'm being um, when I was young, if I'm being naughty and saying something stupid, my father did not say anything. He did not need to do anything. He just being quiet, solemn over there. I immediately retract my statement. So doesn't even need to yell and shout. It's his conduct itself it already says a lot. So another one is protect our thoughts from pollutions. Right, maintain the purity of our thoughts. Like just like Confucius teaching his student Yan Wei, uh, protect our true nature. How to do that? Overcome our thoughts. You know, overcome our you know, desires to see something that is uncourteous, that is dirty, that is um, that is polluting our mind. So those are all the fault, the protection we need to implement towards our speech, our thoughts, our, our action. So how do we protect our actions from misconduct? Um, do not kill, do not steal, do not conduct sexual misconduct, do not um, intoxicate yourself too much. Protect our heart by staying away from grief, staying away from hatred. For example, like greed. Do you guys have uh, feeling moody sometimes, or feeling very unhappy? More or less, it's related to greed. Just like um, the um, teaching says, a lot of suffering came out from greed. What is greed? Desires. I want this. I crave this. And because of these cravings, you um, felt inadequate. You felt lacking. And people not listening to you, or you don't get what you want, and then you become depressed, you become uh, dejected, and then give rise to moods. You know, oh, I don't like this. I'm not happy about this, etc., etc., etc. So those are all coming out from the inside. We cannot put the responsibility, relegate the responsibility to the external factors. Because Buddhism um, is all about uh, learning from the inside. It's about reflecting it the inside. So in Buddhism, there is a lot of um, there is a famous um, stories. People arguing about you know whether the wind makes the flag move or the um, or the flag moves by itself. So it says that it's not the external factor like wind or flags is your heart that moves so always start from the source uh, before we look at the outside so if we understand there's sufferings that we're feeling now look at inside what are we asking for what are we yearning for you know, what are we like uh, craving for uh, and then we need to also reflect on our uh, conducts um, and when we have any issues and problems in our conducts and our thoughts, always um, 
ask ourselves, is this something I need to do? Is this something I'm responsible for? Um, is this something right? If so, do it. Uh, Master Ying Guang emphasized on this. Do your part and do your job. Fulfill responsibility at the best of your ability. Only then we can adhere with the path of Buddha towards the direction of Buddhahood. So do your job, do your responsibility, your responsibility and have an attitude of you know moderation, kindness, forgiveness. Only then you fall, you will walk in the path of Buddha. If we do not have that at all, we are always trying to argue, trying to you know find faults in others. You know, very stingy with our praise, very stingy with our, um, very ungenerous. And you know, trying to yearn, desire something out of your responsibilities or means, you were walking against the path of Buddhahood. That means you're going towards sufferings, not liberations. So, this is how we, this is how we can maintain connection with the Buddha by putting our mind in the right place, by putting ourselves in. You know, by being sincere, start from the roots. What is the root? Our thoughts, our intentions. So, thoughts and intentions are the roots of all our actions and speech. Only when this is corrected, then we can correct our course. Teacher always hope uh, students uh, want uh, to be successful. So this is what any good teacher does. And Amitabha Buddha himself has made 48 vows in total and this vow has perfected the name Amitabha Buddha or Amitabha um, we, if we want to get out of six realms liberate from this cycle of sufferings we need to start from you know cultivating our view right view correcting our direction and our thoughts. If you want to rely purely on our ability to overcome our thoughts, uh, erroneous thoughts, erroneous views, it's like trying to stop a fall from falling to the ground. Like a waterfall, you're trying to stop the waterfall that is flowing from reaching the ground. It's very hard, working against gravity. Um, that's where the difficulty is, actual difficulty is. So what can we do? Amitabha Buddha made a very good convenient method for us, you know, a ladder for us to get there. If everyone loves to attach to something, you know, everyone's got to be hungry on something to keep going, right? Let them be hungry on the name of Amitabha and nothing else. So instead of you attaching in thousands of things, let you attach in one thing. And that one thing that can lead you to enlightenment. So all his practice for eons and eons of time, eons, five kalpas they call it, five great kalpas, five kalpas I think, um, is to perfect this Amitabha so that people can use this to gain enlightenment. It's like an essence. Usual method of um, practice in Buddhism start from cost and then you know plant the seeds, water it, and then you become the fruit. Cause, condition, effect, right? It's like eating man mantu. Oh. Usual method. It's like, yeah, planting seeds, right? Um, you have to plant the weed seeds, you need to water it, you need to, you know, wait for the harvest. And then you harvest, you need to, you know, grind in a meal, make it into flour before it becomes mantou, the buns, Chinese buns. That's the fruit. Seeds to fruits. Right? But in Pure Land, 
you go straight to the kitchen and get the mantle out of the steam bun. The steamers. All this thing was done for you already. Nicely packaged. So this is the uniqueness of Pure Land method. All we need to do is to hold on to this name. Like a ticket. Because the way he did this is name already encompasses his in, his eons of merits. That means he give away these merits just like that to become Buddha to everyone else. Um, as long as people who receive this gift hold on to it, chanting name, hold on to it, and correspond with the uh, mindset of Buddha, which is what we mentioned just now. Sincerity, pure heart. As long as they hold on to the tickets, have the right mindset, they will get to the fruit very quickly. So this is the best part about this teaching, this school. Pure land is close and pure. So, I'm sorry, um, Pure Land is like making us closer and closer to Pure Land. The first closer is because Pure Land is Mahayana. Mahayana means you know, helping all sentient beings, not just yourself, to become Buddha. So, Mahayana is faster than Hinavaya, which is the smaller vehicle. Second, spec, sec, second close means Zen Buddhism. Or Chan Buddhism, which is among all the Mahayana teaching, this is very quick. Right. The third one is Pure Land. Pure Land is quick towards Buddhahood because it's very close. They shorten the path from, say, 100 kilometers to 1 kilometers. So, Pure Land, the Amitofo means, is equal, equivalent to the Zen meditation, the highest form. To put a Buddhist, uh, to put an example in Buddhist uh, Sutra, there is a Bodhisattva. Just a sec. That's two famous sayings. First one is do not doubt, do not um, mix in with other methods and other thoughts, and then do not stop. No doubt, no uh, mixing, no stopping. Consistent. That's the method to perfect your cultivation of Amitabha. Another saying is say less, chan more. Only then you will sever this waterfall of your thoughts using the Amitabha. So this Bodhisattva, he's practicing like normal, right? Follow the teachings and stuff. And when he reached a level and he saw Amitabha Buddha talk to, to giving Dhamma talk to him only, immediately he leaped all the way to the highest level of uh, cultivation because there are stages, right? So this is how powerful the um, this four name is. So people who understand the benefits of chanting Amitabha will naturally incline to do that. Will be diligent to do that because there is true benefit, there's true um, progression with this in this lifetime. All right. And this chance of meeting this kind of teachings is very rare. Right? And to believe to actually do it is even rarer. So going back to the topic, uh, we're trying to talk about this eight, um, eight, eight uh, scenarios of one who spin the Dharma wheel, the Buddha. Last, we are talking about the seventh one. The eighth one is Parinirvana. How do you end this performance, so to speak, of um, spreading the Dharma? Buddha only appear Nirvana, which is what we call pass away, to the lower, to the people from middle and lower rank of the um, teaching, 
this category is not uh, discriminatory. It's people who cannot understand the Dharma yet or cannot realize the Dharma yet. Uh, that means they have not perfected their, te- their own practice yet. So when they look at Buddha pass away, they feel like, oh, I need to catch up. So only for people on that level. So Buddhism, we call it Mietu, which means um, Miet means cease to be. Tu means help people ferry over to the other side. Cease to be and ferry over. So cease to be slaves to your affliction and ferry over people from affliction to happiness, from suffering to liberation, from suffering. Once we ferry over the waterfall of affliction, reach the other side, that's what mean ferry over means in Buddhism. Du. Du chuan, du. When we ferry over to the other side, we cease to be afflicted by greed, hatred, ignorance, you know, all the troubles, six rims, blah, blah, blah. People who cultivate One of the main ingredients is to have body heart Without body heart It's either body heart or the heart of suffering If we do not have a body heart That means we won't be seeking to liberate from six dreams We're still stuck in this cycle of birth and death, birth and death, which is sufferings. Um, people with the mindset of stucking in six, six rims cannot, no matter what they did, cannot get out of six rims because they still want to be in there. So the body heart is number one priority to get out of six rims. Only then you use the convenience given by Amitofo, chanting Amitofo. So in the sutra it says, invoke the body heart, then chant Amitofo to be to vow to go to Pure Land. What is body heart? Uh, so we talk about ferry over to the other side, ferry over to liberation. So how do we do that? Chanting Amitofo is like holding on to the pedal and keep going through these strong currents of afflictions, six ribs. Uh, Master Ying Guang has a example. Last time, last life, past life, we always have a certain level of cause and effect we did, deeds we did that affect us. If all the bad deeds we did in the past life is to be materialized, right, put in a cube, one by one, block by block, the whole universe could not contain it. So this is how many bad and good we have done in the past. And this is how, why sometimes we feel like we are helpless against it in our life. That's why Amitabha Buddha is using it, because it allows you to use his help to get over this. Because affliction, we have accumulated like as much as the universe, right? It's like sinking in the bottom of the ocean. And Buddha's um, vow, Amitabha Buddha's vow, is like the ships, ships of Amitabha. As long as you're willing to get on board the ships to save yourself from drowning, you will be able to get to the other side. Uh, understanding this level of importance that everyone wants to go there even when some people who you know at the passing at the dying moment sees the image of hell that he will be going because of his deeds if he able to turn around and think remind himself of Amitofo at that very moment he also will be able to when on board and go to Pure Land, which is the other side, not sinking further and further in his own doing. So, there is a real case of a person pass away, passing away, and his brother says, Chan Amitofo, you be 
you you will um, re relieve yourself from the sufferings. Immediately chime it off. Instead of following that thought and falling further down. So the vow of you know, the real value of Amitabha is to cease this flow of life and death, life and death from continuing, no longer stuck in this cause and effect, effect and cause, cause and effect. So, like, say, so other than overcoming our thoughts, our views, normally we also need to overcome the we say waves and waves of um, afflictions like grains, like salt, like sands this is how much our affliction is how hard it is for us to um, overcome it because we are like it's like sands right? you can't filter out as much and it's permeable to everywhere else it's very hard to come back sometimes if we um, stuck with the um, attached to the situation we look at attached to the phenomenon we very hard to get out of it and because we attach to this phenomenon we follow the cycle we start becoming unbecoming becoming unbecoming because everything is conditional they are not there they assist and then they stop the so back to the word Nirvana, Yuan Qi. What is Nirvana? Uh, in other simpler words, it means perfection. It's Nirvana. Seizing affliction stops from troubling you. It's Nirvana. Trying to um, explain the word nirvana. Another way to describe nirvana is and review entirely your true nature, your Buddha nature, fully recovered, fully revealed, no longer be covered by troubles. So, put it in day to day. It is first thing, first aspect of Nirvana is we no longer attach on the surface. We don't attach this to the phenomenon. Uh, we no longer stuck in our self false image of ourself you know the false ego no longer attached to you know this you and I you and I you and them that mindset uh, no longer attached to time no longer attached to um, you know, the world and stuff like that because true nature is just true nature it's just what it is uh, do not add to it do not minus anything from it it's what it is able to return to that state of you know, not adding not minusing not doing but you know, equanimity is one aspect of nirvana perfection and cessations of suffering. Um, so how do we start? How do we even start? It starts from our purity of heart. Oh, purity of heart means no attachments, not, able, not stuck in certain roles, certain situations, certain image. 
out in uh, another commentary. So all this is trying to support the definition of what is nirvana. In that, in other sutra, if a person has a very low, say, do not have deep enough fortune and merits, cultivation, they could not bring out the respect towards the Dharma. They could not bring out the mindset of this is rare, for, uh, fortunate and very lucky to meet these teachings, to meet these Amitabha teachings. If one could not bring out this one, that means they're still clouded in afflictions. They are unable to bring it out. That, you know, mindset of this is rare. I need to make good use of this. Uh, we talk about here, I um, remember himself also, myself also very um, reflective of these words. At the beginning, be very um, diligent. Right? Before we met Master Ching Kong, say, we felt like this is so hard to meet Master Ching, uh, Master Ching Kong. I need to diligent, correct my thoughts. And then from Venerable Cheng De, he met Master Ching Kong a lot, right? As he deals with and works with Master Ching Kong day to day, almost like many times a year that level of you know sincerity that level of it's rare i need to you know, take make use of this well it has lessened you know getting more complacent so master himself uh, one year a year and a half ago he passed away right uh, 20 22 july right so it shocked me as well it shocked master venerable as well it forced him to you know, remember you know, how hard it is to have a good teacher and how important it is to put as much effort as we can in getting to the other side. One of the biggest conditions for us to be Buddha, to success, to be successful in our cultivation is a good teacher a good mentor. They are one of the biggest conditions that accelerates our enlightenment. A big help. Because they will give you a very concrete advice based on your situation. Right? Based, based on your living environment. So it's very rare to have a good mentor directing you in this path. Master Ching Kong passed away. Uh, it's also because of sentient beings, not because he, he wants to. Because he, he stay because of sentient beings. He leave because of sentient beings. Because he stays to expand the Dharma, to, you know, remind everyone. He leaves also remind everyone how fast everything changes uh, to inspire everyone to be diligent this is not going to be forever this arrangement is not going to be forever that's why buddha will appear nirvana like that for people who is not fully uh, not not there yet but if you talk about reality Buddha is like, there's another term, thus is, you know, Buddha is not coming from left to right, up and down, Buddha is Buddha, he's right exactly where he is to be, um, that's the nature of the Buddha, uh, it's permeable, it's everywhere, it's omnipresent, it's not coming from left and right, it's there, there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to came from, there's nowhere to go to, it is everywhere. Uh, so, another great monk from Tang Dynasty, Master Zizhe, he's the Shakyamuni Buddha, comes again. Mm. Remember, Shakyamuni Buddha's job is not done when he attained Nirvana in, in India. He appeared again as Master Zizhe, very famous in Tang China. Right. Founded the school of Tian Tai. 
talks about all this. So, same thing for our book, our compilation uh, of the Pure Land classics into this one book in Finite Life Sutra. Uh, it's also done by people who are not, uh, who are from Bodhisattva and Buddha's background. Remember, everyone, every saint, sages, especially Buddha, Bodhisattva, they came here, they appear manifest, you know, because they have a mission. They, all they are doing is trying to get, you know, as many sentient beings they pray as possible, set up the Dharma, set up the, like this one, set up the foundational classic so that people can continue practicing in longer time, longer periods of time. There's a direction for them to go to. Uh, this Infinite Sutra is one of them. So, why would I only appear to the people of ordinary and, uh, let's say, um, lesser um, awareness? People with high awareness or high uh, cultivation, high uh, achievements in their realization of their true nature, which means they are advanced Buddhists, advanced um, cultivators, Bodhisattvas. Um, they don't need that. They no longer attach to the. They are no longer attached to the emotion. They are attached to this life and death. So there's no need to. There's no need to for them to show from Buddha has appeared and then stop, stop the appear. They 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 already reach there. They already um, uh, sort of you know like um, see what the Buddha sees. Uh, not stuck in cycle of birth and death. All they need is to perfect it into Buddhahood. So these are the advanced cultivators. So Buddha will show them how to perfect their Buddhahood. Perfect that path. So in the in Five Sutras, right, when we're beginning reading the first few chapters, it talks about uh, Bodhisattva Universal Worthy Pu Xian um, and 16, 16 entourage that follows his teaching. Um, appeared in these talks of Buddha talking about Pure Land. And this 16 entourage of Bodhisattva Bu Xian, uh, they immediately go into the Samadhi, not just normal Samadhi, great Samadhi, great concentration, great meditative concentration, great Samadhi of flower adornment. It's a term um, when Buddha is giving another talk in, in the Huayan Sutra, which is um, talking about uh, this is the pre-historical Buddha time when he, no, sorry, this is when he attained enlightenment, he think about Huayan, he talk about those events, the, the real Buddhism directly to these advanced students before he talked to us about the Four Noble Truth in the world, human will. So all these people are advanced students. And all they are trying to do in these congregations is to demonstrate to us who have not advanced, who are intermediate and beginner uh, cultivators, how do we get to that? Real example in our life, in our world. People who listened and actually chant Amitabha for usually three years to achieve basic achievements, right? Kung Fu Champion. So when they don't think, they chant Amitabha for. When they chant Amitabha for, nothing else comes in. That's level one. Level two is, um, you know, Si Ching is very hard to explain, um, but. There are three levels. They categorize in that. The first level is uh, when you chant Amitabha, nothing comes in. Just Amitabha. And then you, you can continue and achieve in one lifetime all the way to the level of enlightenment. 
为定慧所摄，为定慧所摄受，安住一处，叫做三昧。啊，这佛一教经有说，自心一处，无事不办。啊啊，就好像我们一心念佛，哎，也是自心一处。The state of entering samadhi is like your mind in one point, and you won't be able to. Uh, everything, nothing stops you from doing it. Um. It's like drilling a spot, and then your mind is focused in that one path. And then you reach all the way to the core of the earth. Your wisdom opens. So this is the samadhi. Samadhi can come in many forms. Chanting Amidaba. We also reach samadhi. And all types of samadhi, they all have different names. Huayan samadhi, Amitabha samadhi. Another sama samadhi is the samadhi of uh, without birth, without death, without becoming, without unbecoming. Samadhi of becoming of unbecoming. Samadhi of without becoming and unbe without unbecoming. Samadhi is a common term, right? 小品波罗经中，啊，萨陀波伦菩萨与文说波罗。And then the term in front of it is depending on where, what, what method they use to attain the same samadhi. 诸法无生三昧，诸法无灭三昧，等等六百万。And there are thousands of samad, millions of samadhis, and this one they say is like、uh, six millions of. Um, samadhis, six million types of samadhis. Um, so to make it easy to understand, there are many samadhis on different conditions entering the state of limitations. Um, so for us, chanting Amitabha for you know, the samadhi of Amitabha chanting is the king of all samadhis. Right. The samadhi of the samadhi, the head of the samadhi. Uh, so that means once you get into the extreme concentration in Chani Amitabha form, you open up the path to thousands of samadhi, one to many. Dharani, Tolani, Dharani. Dharani is a Sanskrit word for you're able to. Hold, preserve. What is preserve? Preserving what? Preserving our merits, our virtue, not doing anything against our Buddha nature. Just like a, a, a bowl, a perfect bowl. When you pour in the water, pour in the tea, you preserve the tea from leaking. The Rani is like this perfect bowl. If the cup has leaked, then the tea leaks out of it. That means the durani is not perfect. You don't have durani. So durani means hold. Another one is they able to um, preserve against the negative deeds, the evil karmas, the you know, bad deeds, impurities. That's why it's very hard to attain the Rani because sometimes we lose a lot. You know, we, we leak out our merits by allowing you know, our mind to be polluted, our speech and action to be negative. Another one is you're able to cover your um, negative karma. So if you have a negative thoughts, and then attain intention, I mean, trying to execute this ill intention. The Rani can preserve you from acting from it. 
can stop you from praying. And praying. So it can hold merits, pre prevent, um, how to say, weed out the, neg uh, you come up, the ne negative karma, and also stop you from acting on your you intention. So Dharani is a very useful um, thing, useful state. So, by example, temple. You give rise to a temple, you give rise to you know, anger, you burn away all your merits. So the Rani has the power of cover up and pre damage control, so to speak. Your hatred, your greed. So you no longer act on your hatred. So the Rani can stop you from acting on ill intention. So this is the power of the Rani. In the great wisdom that varies the people. So this is the discourse from the Bodhisattva. It talks about when you enter the right meditation, we call it Samadhi. The right kind of meditation is called Samadhi. So when you enter the right kind of meditation, you enter the Rani. So this Samadhi, right meditation, combined with ability to perceive the nature, the real nature of the world, the, of, of the phenomena, that's wisdom. Samadhi, wisdom, equals to the Rani. So you have extreme concentration, unmoved, you have extreme, you have perfect, clear wisdom. Right, of how everything comes and stops the, stop the come, becoming and unbecoming. It becomes a Dharani. Somebody is correspondent to your heart. Dharani is do not need to correspond with your heart. What is corresponding with your heart? Corresponding with your heart means it relays on your heart. If your heart is concentrating you get somebody so you need to meditate you need to chant Amitabha you need to meditate on something to get into Dharani I mean to get into somebody but Dharani is not Dharani is anytime anywhere not relying on your mind heart like when you scold people angry your heart is burning with anger the Rani do not lost merit right you lost your meditation you lost your Samadhi when you lost your concentration you were angry and all that but the Rani do not get lost even when you're angry or when you greed so this is why the Rani is so powerful Samadhi this lifetime maybe you achieve it you attain that you know, meditative concentration. But next life, not necessary. You, you're not necessarily able to achieve the same thing. Re example, Tang Dynasty, Su Dongbo, right? He was a monk in the past life, and not just normal monk, a monk that achieved enlightenment. I mean, achieved a certain level of enlightenment. However, he has reincarnated back in the next life, and he lost his samadhi. He won't be able to do the same thing as he was in the past life. The Rani, no matter where you go, up and down, you know, hell or heaven or anywhere, it will still be there. So even when you're burning with troubles, burning with anger, burning with rage, the Rani do not lost. It will stay with you. Once you get the Rani, you never lost it. Until you, yeah, you never lost it. It's with you for life, for many lives. So back to the sutra term. Anytime, anywhere, entering the samadhi of flower adornment, hua uh, yin, coming out of sutra of flower adornment. So what is wuru? What is attain? What is um, going into the samadhi? Going into samadhi requires meditative ability. That means able to hold and able to be to see the realities. So wisdom and meditation. Hua um, Yin, Samadhi relies on wisdom. Anytime means you can go in and go out anytime you like. You don't need to sit down, take a deep breath, take a few minutes and then meditate, concentrate. 
normal samadhi. That's why this is special. Normal samadhi, normal procedure. You need to slow down, concentrate, sit properly, proper postures. Concentrate on your breath and then slowly enter the, the, the samadhi. All right, that's a normal procedure. Hua Yen Samadhi, do not need that. That's Hua Yen Samadhi came at the blink of your thoughts. I want to go into Samadhi, you go in there. When you say just intention enough is enough for you to get into Hua Yen Samadhi. So this is very concrete, very detailed commentary, you know, from the sutra, it's compiled by Mr. Huang. It's very thorough. Hua Yen Samadhi, the full name is Buddha's Flower Adornment. Samadhi. What does it mean, Buddha's Flower Adornment? Um, this Samadhi used, there is a foundation for Samadhi, right? Uh, that's why the name is different. This one is using the Buddha's um, world, Buddha's reality as the foundation of this concentration, of this Samadhi. What is Buddha's nature? First aspect of Buddha nature is no duality, no conflicts. There's no, there's no you and I. There's no up and down. So it's one. Describing Buddha's world is like one truth, reality. So there's only one, there's no two, three, four, five. Everyone becomes one. This is what one means, equal. There's no high and low. That's why when we learn to become Buddha, when we go towards Buddhahood, Buddhahood this is important. Right. So we start from purity, from equality, from uh, compassion. Two key words, purity and equality. Purity and non-discrimination. People you hate, so put it in real example. People you hate, you're able to respect them. People you don't like, annoy you, you're able to respect them. And you respect them to the level that you would pay your respect towards the Buddha, towards the the, the Buddha. This is uh, no duality, no conflict. Another aspect to describe Buddha's nature. That's why I say one true nature. One is purity, equality. True is no falsehood, no, no perversion, nothing. Everything is as is. No, um, you know, twisted. It means everything as is. And nature, or we call it the, the realities. All right. um, Dharma realities. It's like when we have a body, right? Buddha has a body, so to speak. Philosophy's body. Um, that body is founded on one oneness, truthfulness, and you know that is the foundation of the Dharma Kaya. That's another Sanskrit term. Sorry, guys. Dharma Kaya means your foundation. Um, we'll, we'll wait. <laughs> That's the um, bedrock you know, of the Buddha. Um, remember, all this term that we use, why is it so varied? Why is it so different? Because they're trying to prevent us from attaching to one term, one concept. Right? As long as we get it, we're able to understand it and then make use of it that's that's what it matters right to not attach to the terms use that as a bridge to cross all this term i mentioned uh, variable measurement so nature of reality the one true reality is no becoming no unbecoming no emptiness no existence uh, so this is the nature of the reality, no duality, nothing, you know, you and I, he and she, nothing like that. Um, this is the core value 
core message trying to bring out from the greatest uh, Mahayana Sutra, the Flower Adornment Sutra. And this one true reality of what Buddha attained is everywhere, over here, right now. It encompasses thousands of phenomena. Fa is the phenomenon. Phenomena, like scientific, we say phenomenon, this phenomenon, that phenomenon. So thousands of phenomena are inside of is in the one true reality. Everything, every people, every single grain, every single atom, atoms, uh, they are coming out of this one true nature, one true realities, and th depend on different conditions. All right, it will get better or get worse, but it's like a reflection of the moon. It's not the real moon, but it's a reflection of the moon. And um, they all arise from the heart. Right? They all came out from the true nature, from the well, true heart, so to speak. Why can't we see it now then, since we're in it? Because we have twisted, like the reflection has been twisted. All right, what is twisted? Twisted by all this Wang Nian, all these wandering thoughts. You know, we diverge away from our true nature. We didn't leave them, even though we're diverging. Moon is still moon, but we already twisted the reflection and all that. So when Buddha is um, back in Buddha's time, there's a student asked him. He said, why is this world so dirty? Why is it so evil? Why is people's heart so negative? Why is it so you know, strong eats the weak and all that? Buddha say it's because of your heart sees it so. That's what you see. And then what about you, Buddha? What does your world look like? He points directly at where he sits. And the whole reality that... So you have your own reality. Buddha's reality is this world is like pure land. It does not change. And he's able to show it to other people what Buddha sees. That's why it's important to gain enlightenment. Sees the world what the Buddha sees. From this deep understanding, from this understanding, you know, this unsurpassed, great understanding, amazing understanding, we understand a lot of amazement. We do something that looks like a miracle, but it's actually the real thing, this part of the reality. And with that action, you know, we perfecting and dignifying our Buddha uh, fruit, which is our Buddhahood. So, flower adornment, hence the word flower adornment. Adorn the cost, adorn ourselves. You know, flower means our um, cause and effect. Um, adorn is an act to perfecting our Buddha nature. Every Bodhisattva, like when you go to Pure Land, Pure Land itself is the practice of flower adornment. Every person who wants to be Buddha has to go through this stage. Flower is cause. Adorned is to you know make it better, make it dignifying, make it perfect. So we're perfecting our cause so that we have a perfect result, a perfect effect, which is Buddhahood using the one true phenomenon, one true realities as your bedrock, where you're based. And use that to con and then understand that nature and then we concentrate in our practice. Amitofo chanting or any method. And then eventually get into one heartedness, one mindedness. It's what we call the Huayan Samadhi, the flower adornment samadhi. Bodhisattvas, you know, everything Bodhisattva did, you know, all the manifestation, all the practice, it's like flower. They're planting the cause for the enlightenment. And then they use it to adorn their Buddhahood that they will be in future. So another, so he's bring out, it's like academics, bring out thousands of sources to enforce the point. 
Another sutra, another commentary means Hua, flower, in this term, is thousands of Buddha's deeds, Buddha's practice, and the begin, the beginning and the root is the same. Um, so, right now, we started to enlighten, started to practice, combined with your Buddha nature, which is already perfected, already there, using these two, so from your current action of trying to gain enlightenment, which is Buddhahood, Bodhisattvahood, into your true nature, the Buddhahood, combine them together, you're able to leave yourself out of these sufferings and go towards perfections of your self. So using another example, pearl. Pearl is shiny, right? Pearl is shiny. That's the nature of the pearl. So pearl, so, so example, pearl has the shininess. That's the nature of the pearl. Right? So use that to describe our true nature, our original self. Right. Pro equals to our true self. The shine of the pearl refers to our wisdom. So our our true self is wise. All right. Same goes for theory and uh, uh, wisdom and your true nature is one. Right. It's not like from wisdom comes, I mean from your true nature comes wisdom. Your true nature is wisdom. Um, just like the pearl is shiny. The shininess is the pearl. So between the shininess and the pearl, right? The shine came from the pearl. Shininess and the pearl itself is one thing. And the pearl is inside the shininess. The shininess is the trait of the pearl. They are both together. So your 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 true realities, your Dhammakaya, you know, your true nature, and the and the effect and the use of the true nature, which is wisdom, is one thing. Uh, there's no who first, who last. There's no. Yeah. So that is what we're trying to understand, grasp the Buddha's reality. Another commentary said, thousands of phenomena arise from our hearts. So thousands of phenomena, thousands of Dharma phenomena came out from your heart. And this true nature we call heart is what we name Buddha's flower adornment. This is how Buddha adorned his own cause, perfecting his effects, and then continue and continue. There's no beginning, there's no end. Right. Um, hence the conclusion, thousands of phenomena, including ours, came out from the heart, came out from the true nature. So Buddha's reality is your true reality, is your it's a way to describe your true self, your true self, not the false ego, your true self. A person, if we understand our true heart, our true reality, our true nature, that's what Hua Yan Samadhi refers to. In conclusion, Buddha's one true reality, one true reality is the true heart. So Master Ching Kong emphasized on a Buddhist practitioner always need to use their true heart, sincerity. Like this Infinite Life Sutra is actually the middle Hua Yan. We call it middle version, the shortened version of Hua Yan Sutra, Flower Dharma Sutra. Our um, uh, way we live, the way we work, the, you know, the way we treat people has to come out from true heart. Only then we correspond ourselves with 
the path of Buddha. So this is the actual concrete use of the, the understanding we have. So he called, summarized this Master Ching Kung. Um, first is sincerity, purity, equality, right um, enlightenment, I mean enlightenment, and right awareness, and the last one is compassion. So there's five of them. Are we sincere? Have I been sincere towards others and myself? Have I, or I'm just trying to uh, placate someone else? You know, tick the box. Second one is, am I pure? Is my mind pure? Is my speech pure? Is my action pure? Am I prejudiced? So that's not pure. All right. Equality. Am I treating everyone equally? Uh, or do I still have, this is higher, that is lower. This is better, that is worse. This is another problem we need to overcome. The fourth one is right awareness. That means rational, not getting confused. The last one is compassion. Right. So all these teachings of Mahayana teachings, right? All these words of Mahayana teachings, Master Ying Guang mentioned 49 years of Shaomini Buddha's teaching. Right. None of them leaves the Buddha's heart, leaves our true nature. All this is just to point us how do we correctly use our heart truthfully. Stop using the false, stop using it, uh, stop abusing it, use it properly. Right. Abusing it means you go to discriminate, you go to um, fulfill the short-lived desires and all that, non-lasting. So the true use of your heart is people who has who you have grieved against, who have grieved against you, or who will treat you well, treat you kind, they are, you no longer um, treat them separately. But your, inside your heart, you're able to treat them equally. Words may be different, but you're equal towards them all. So that's all for today. Thank you so much, Ramita, for...